him to be able to, to tell us something to, that will help us in our daily lives. Lord, mm -hmm. well, I ask you to please go with each and every one of our homes and Lord, allow us to make it back home safe. Mm -hmm. I pray this prayer in the name of Christ for, for his sake. Amen. Amen. Like we were studying, and I, you know, at some point we'll finish that. It's not good to make long-term decisions on short-term emotions. Okay, Amen. so I want us to make sure that we guard our emotions accordingly, and that we make sure we see God's word on what we're doing. Now I don't know if I'm gonna get this thing to work right or not. I hadn't had time to set it up. Uh, so nobody had no problems at work or anything. Everybody. Yes, yes, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> they broke me up. <laughs> Uh, all right. I couldn't turn down the cheek. I couldn't do it. All right. Well, hopefully by the end of tonight, you have a, a, little, a little more peace about it. We can help you. I couldn't do it. Alright. To, to uh, save us some time, I'm just going to read to you all what I'm going to show you. I made copies of this, and I don't know that we'll get to finish it all, but I want you to have it. It's got some scriptures in there that I want you to pay attention to. But I came across an article that a lady wrote. She actually wrote this on the 4th, which is a few days before the election. And she titled it, New President, Same King. So I'm going to read this, and we're going to talk about it, and then you know we're going to get into it. I was trying to show it on the screen, but it's not working. She said, I suspect it would be an understatement to say that social media has been saturated with posts regarding the upcoming presidential election. Who will be the next president of the United States? Will it be Hillary Clinton? Will it be Donald Trump? She said, I read Facebook posts where people are battling against one another with vicious words as they seek to justify why their candidate of choice should have declared the winner and sit in the coveted seat of the Oval Office. She said, I've watched as even Christians have stood to aggressive tactics engaging, engaging in heated debates over Clinton versus Trump. While who runs the United States of America is a vital issue, I think that many are forgetting what is most important. No matter who becomes the next president of the United States, God is the king. Yes. That's true. She said, yes, God is ruler over heaven and earth, always has been and forever will be. And she said, the 24th division of the Old Testament book of Psalms states in verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Who is the king of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Henceforth, at the end of every day, every year, every month, and even every century, God has always been king and his reign is not ready to end. Amen. Now she says, I'm not suggesti suggesting that we take a passive approach and not care about the presidential election as well as other elections. Of course not. That would be absurd. However, the point that I want to convey, especially to Christians, is don't allow yourself to be so consumed with thoughts and conversations regarding the election that you find yourself taking on an ungodly attitude and mindset 
or even saying things that you later will regret because your words did not bring honor and glory to God. In fact, I would encourage you to pray about your decision before you vote and after you vote and once the election is complete. Uh, then she says, one last thing. Uh, she goes on to quote the rest of the scripture. For who have founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that have clean, clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up, who have lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn it deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God and salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. So lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up the everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. All right, and then she goes on to say, so be encouraged. God is in control. Even when we cast our votes, allow, God allows the candidates to take office. In the prophetic book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, it tells us how the story ends. And when the story ends, you won't see the names of Clinton or Trump. <laughs> God, the king of glory, the ruler of heaven and earth, will one day come back. And his kingship is unstoppable, whether we believe it or not. So I implore you to realize that the king of glory is coming. He will bring true law and order and is coming back for people that are prepared, that have prepared themselves. So are you ready for his arrival? So, I thought that was so profound because we cannot afford to get so caught up in the, what feels real in our world that we lose sight of what we're really living for. Amen. We're living this life to live again. Amen. And we're here as ambassadors of the one who's already won total victory. Amen. So any momentary setback that we may encounter, if this happens to be a setback, in the grand scheme of things, it does not compare to the glory that's going to be revealed. But we got to know that, because otherwise you'll feel hopeless, and you'll feel like this is a lost cause, okay? Are any questions or comments so far? Yes, I do. Yes, ma'am. I just have a comment. Work with NAACP. I just want to say that I just really have a I'm going to say I have a problem with black folks not getting out votes. <coughs> Looking at what all we have been through, mm -hmm. especially in this state. Mm -hmm. And I just have a serious issue with that. Mm -hmm. Me too. I mean, it, it's different if you're not able to get out. But if you're able-minded and you just didn't go because you just didn't want to go mm -hmm. or whatever, I have a serious <coughs> issue with that. Yeah, yeah that, that is a, uh, to some extent, an issue. But I happen to believe that if they didn't vote before, <laughs> this could cause people to realize the importance of voting right? and not taking that for granted. Right? And I think part of that, we're going to read a little bit of this, is part of it, and I'm going to say this very lovingly to us as a people, I think in some ways we kind of got comfortable mm -hmm. with the fact that we have a black president. That's right. That's what some saying. people, not all of us, but some of us may have got a little comfortable and thought that it was more about us arriving instead of realizing that God orchestrates every That's single right. That's true. So we can't afford, even in that, we can't afford to lose sight of when we, even when we, when we get hills and valleys, we can't lose sight of the guidance that God provides mm -hmm. in the peaks and the valleys. Mm -hmm. And as a people collectively, we kind of maybe lost sight of that a little bit some extent. So we're going to be all right. All right. I, this, this is, uh, some of this is, like I said, some notes that I found. I uh, just titled it, Why Would God Allow This to Happen? This doesn't necessarily have to just be the election. And that's why I didn't say, why did this, this it? it pertains to this now because this happens to be what's right before us. But it, what's that? On time. It is on time. But anytime something happens to your life, in your life, and you wonder why would God allow this to happen? The thought process that goes behind this will come into play. Okay? The text is, is, is 1 Corinthians 127. We'll get to it in just a minute. But let's start reading now through this a little bit. Let somebody start reading at the top, please. Why would God allow this to happen? Why would God allow this to happen? Some skeptics might ask, why would God do things that are so hard to believe? Why would God do things in a different way to avoid the controversy? Keep reading again. Yeah. Why do things like Noah's Ark, the virgin birth, and salvation through death on a cross 
which many people consider nonsensical. And why choose weak and faulty people to proclaim the gospel throughout the body, throughout the Bible, and even to this day? It's a good question, and the answer to it is very interesting. Let's take a look. All right, that's the test. Let's, let's turn in our Bibles today. But I want to read a couple different translations. First Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 27. First Corinthians is after Romans in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, then 1 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 27. All right. 1 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 27. All right, somebody read this. Read, read King James first, and then let's read another translation. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. All right, somebody give me another translation. Okay, go ahead. All right. God purposely, purposely chosen what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise. And he chose the world to consider weak in order to change the power. All right, read that first part of yours again, though, John. First, first clause there. John, <coughs> try to read it real loud so everybody can hear. I want y'all to hear how that one reads. God, cho God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense. In God order. purposely chose what the world considers nonsense. For what reason? To shame the To shame, uh, to shame the wise. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Right, okay. Let, let's dig on it a little bit. He, God uses a lot of times what we as people in this society consider foolish and stupid to bring down those that think very highly of themselves. Remember, he's against pride. And as a point of humility and a humbling effort to remind people who's actually in control, he allows things to happen that don't make sense to get you out of thinking rationally about why this happened and why that didn't happen. Y'all believe that? You can look right now and see. Okay. Whether, you, whether you're for or against, you can see this as a change agent that God can allow to happen that can get the attention of people who may not have been so focused on him. All right, question? All right. Also, God, that's the way of God bringing your pride down to earth. You got to talk about that one. <laughs> Very good. That's where we're going next. Any other, anybody else? Any other questions or comments? All right, so that's what that text is letting us know. And the other side of it, he chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. What does that part mean? What did George say on that one, the second part of that text? Okay, in, in order to shame the world, he chose what the world considered weak in order to shame the power. All right, to shame the power. What does that mean? He chose what was weak to shame the power. Too much what you said about the wise. I mean, those who think they are powerful, he chose someone that society in a sense think is um, less powerful or weak to show them that the powerful is just not as powerful. Right. Exactly. What's the best example of that we ever experienced? Jesus. Amen. When Jesus came to this world and became our suffering servant, that was the most weak, lowly illustration of mankind that you could ever see. Right. But God used that to dispel everything else that was deemed powerful to let everybody know that he can use anything, whether it's great or small, mighty or weak, anything to get his will and his purpose accomplished. Well, if you said that, you know, just take the other race or nothing. Now, everybody talking about how he was but the best qualified, the uh, highly qualified, and dumb someone qualified to do anything. Right. Exactly. So, you know, like you just said, yeah. we can do that. You know, you that to, uh, Absolutely. I, I'm going to say this you, to, to help him. I don't know which way this is going to go, and right. I, I'm not even here to share my personal. Right. It's not about what I think. Right. But right. I'm going to tell you this. I don't care how. How horrible Donald Trump has been in the past. Right. God has the ability to change yeah. everything. Yeah. 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 So I, I said that too. I said, yeah. I said why can't he do it like Saul? He going to turn into the world. <laughs> <laughs> he can do it. And the other side of that, he can still be who everybody.
everybody thinks he is be the worst man in the world, and God said that's the key to And the point is, the emphasis is not on the people. We got to focus on who actually has the real power. And trust that whichever way it falls out, God is ultimately in control of my life. So let me not worry about anything, nor let me sink to a level that the people will think that they got an edge over me. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to walk this faith walk in a way that the world is paying attention. Let them talk about what yeah. they think is going to happen and all that. Put your trust back in God. This might bring us up to people back to God. That's right. God intends to do things in a way that we wouldn't in order to get His will accomplished. Mm -hmm. right. This could be the best unifying thing be in the world. We've been trying to unite people in a way that we, yeah. we think is best. That's this right. could be the one thing that unites us in a way that we've never been united before. We never know. We are divided. We have been divided to some extent. Alright? Alright, questions, comments? Alright, let's go. Let's keep moving. Let's read down a little bit more. Alright? Three points. Somebody help me out. Somebody read for me. Three points I want to make in regards to the scripture that will hopefully answer the question. And the question again is why would God allow this to happen? The first one is what again? Pride is one of the worst sins. Alright, we just heard that mention before. Pride is one of the worst sins. God hates pride. And let's talk about pride a little bit more to find out why he hates it and why he will go through great measures to make sure, listen to me now, that your pride is removed when you are a believer. God will go through some drastic measures to make sure that you don't have pride in your life when you want to live for him. Because you can't truly live for him if pride is a part of your everyday actions. Alright, so sometimes you got to get down and ugly with you to get rid of your pride problem. I did. I got down on my authorized, authorized knees. They were hurting, but I got down. I see, he brought me too much. <laughs> we all have those moments. All right, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. Keep reading for me, Throughout the scriptures, it is abundantly clear that pride is one of the worst sins, and it has serious consequences. All right, I'm underlining that part because this is what we don't realize a lot of time. Read that. God opposes pride because it blinds people. That's what it does. To yes. us. It blinds us. It blinds us. How does pride blind us as it's people? Anger will do it. Anger is a way that it can do it. How does it blind us? Selfish. Selfish. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe doing it yourself, but it's not God. Very good. All right. Yeah. All right. What are you saying? I said self -focus. self -focus. Exactly. We begin to put our attention on self. Yeah, yeah. And when we're looking at self, we can't see God. Okay? All right. We're going to leave that a little bit. All right. Stay on the Say that again. Stay on the smile that is Absolutely. Very good. All right. We'll read a little bit more. He causes people to think they're too smart or too strong for faith in a higher power. That's what it eventually leads to. It may start out innocent. I can handle this. I can do it. And eventually, before you know it, you don't have any need for faith. <coughs> and then you think that you're too strong to believe in something beyond yourself. Because you become so used to doing things yourself and dependent upon yourself for the results that you leave no room for God to show up and be supernaturally beyond your limitations. So that's how it blinds us. It ends up limiting us because we no longer live by faith. That's what I can see in last week. Uh, when people think that they have they have gone and done things on their own soul to when it's time <coughs> when God do something for them, they think it's he already do miracles every day, but it's so miraculous. Right. He's been doing it, you just been thinking you've been doing it yourself. Right. So he has to remind us from time to time. Alright. Anybody else? If y'all behind me, y'all talk to me this is Where is the fine line drawn? Because we always say um, God does what God can do with that thing, but we have to yeah, do for yeah. ourselves. Right. Help me out with Good that. Question. <laughs> Good question. That's yeah. the issue that I have because I'm a fixer. Yeah. I'm a handler. Right. I take care of my business. Yes, but then you got to get out the way and let God do it. That's right. So help me. All right. That's a, I love that. Yes. Do it, yeah. because, and, and the reason I love that because Responsible people have the biggest problem. Yes, sir. When you are self-sufficient, you're independent, a lot of times single parents, a lot of times struggle with that. Because the men struggle with that sometimes, you're a provider for your family and whatnot. But the problem is this. 
the world and the way we have to live in the world requires us to handle our responsibilities. <laughs> but when you're dealing with spiritual things, you can't afford to live a spiritual way the way you've done it physically with your, your worldliness. So you have to begin to retrain your mind to separate between what I have to do and the natural versus what I need to do in the spirit. So that's where the battle really becomes. Because I have to now reprogram my mindset when I'm so used to just handling things as they come. Now I'm waiting on the Lord to handle things that I'm used to doing myself. So that's where it begins. It begins with a retraining of how you think. Because you can't really start to uh, discipline yourself in that area until you recognize the difference between the two. Because in, in a responsible person's mind, if I do nothing, I'm irresponsible. Right. And things are just going to fall apart. But when God says, trust in me, he doesn't need you to help him. So i got to recognize the difference between the two. So that's where it starts. Now, when you recognize that you have to think differently and train your mind, you got to use the word as you got it. And when you begin to study and meditate on what he's saying and asking him these questions that anyone who has needs wisdom asks, mm -hmm. he begins to give you discernment on matters that are, are necessary for you to take care of as far as your affairs versus concerns and problems and, and life <coughs> things that he has ordered in your life. It's different for each person, but that's when it comes to the play, my sheep know my voice. And when he begins to speak to you, and you <coughs> try to do something that's just not working, and it's not working out the way it's supposed to, yes, that's what tends to happen. And then you become, you become so tired mm -hmm. and so worn out that he now has your attention, and that's his way of humbling you and stripping you of your reliance. And then when you usually get down to that, that's when you're ready to let go of it. And that's when he begins to show So that's tend to, that tends to be how you progress to that place. So if you kind of end that place where you're bumping your head a little bit, you're right on track. <laughs> I can make a decision, and I will make the decision. This is what I'm going to do. And then I think about it again, and I'm like, uh oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm supposed to give that to you. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me. That's mature. And handle it. Lord, work it out for me, and I just sit back and be quiet. And I know, I know that's the right thing to do, but it's... I don't want to have to keep having to stop and go. <laughs> but you know, I guess that's just growth. It's a part of it's a process to get to that. But you're becoming more aware of it. Where it may have taken you a longer time before, now you recognize it a little quicker. Not so in the head would make it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a process and at yeah. some point you begin you begin to start seeking him before you even start making those decisions. Because you gotta, like I said, reprogram what you're used to doing to discipline yourself to do it his way. Does that kind of help? Yeah. All right, all right, Trevor. Um, this is a little story I used to do. My older dad used to tell me when I was young. I told the story before, but um, it was a son and his son. It was a dad and his son. He know his son was going to live weight. And he bought his son a set, a weight set. So he was like, okay, I'm going to put the first set on. I want you to do 10 reps. He knocked the 10 reps out fast and, you know, with ease. So he put the next set on. He was like, all right, go do it. He got, he was doing it then like third, like the last few sets, he kind of struggled, but he got through it. Mm -hmm. And he was like, ooh, I'm feeling good about myself. <clears throat> then dad throw another, another set on, he was like, all right, good. <laughs> then he was like, then he got to the last, and he was like, <laughs> Then his dad picked it up, he said, you tired? He was like, yeah, let me go on, get some water, got some water. Then, you know, he started doing the weight, couldn't get it. Dad picked it up, you tired? Mm -hmm. No, 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 I can do it. I know I can do this. Mm -hmm. he got it back up. Then, you know, there was a theory that if guys get mad, that's the stronger they get, you know, the hook effect. Mm -hmm. But um, he, you know, he figured that the more frustrated, the more angry he got, the less he couldn't get it up. Mm -hmm. Then his dad, then his dad literally saw him. He said, all right. He said, no problem. <coughs> he said, I can't do it. He said, see, that's the problem right there. You put I in front of him. Mm -hmm. He said, why am I here? He was like, spot me. He said, hello, that's why I'm here. He said, he said, the main reason you feel that way is because you're so prideful. Mm -hmm. You were put in a situation where you feel, oh, I not, I got the last two out of the way. But mm -hmm. why can't I get this? Because you don't realize weight add on every time. 
And it's because of our pride. Mm -hmm. We can't see that. Oh, okay. I got that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's all right. But all these things are true. So God will allow you to feel like you failed. Or feel like you sometimes we make you even feel like you're overwhelmed. Just so that you'll stop trying so much on the effort and you'll start refocusing your attention back on him. And that's a tough love way for you to start back depending on him. Okay. Questions, comments? All right. Let's uh, let's go back here and talk about this pride a little bit more. So it tends to make people a little bit smart and they don't have room for faith. All right. Next little paragraph. Pride is also usually. Pride is also usually at the root of all the other sins. Listen to that. All the other sins that we end up doing, usually you can trace it back to pride. Where it begins. Mm. All right. Mm. Going, when someone thinks they are superior to others mm -hmm. or too smart to believe in God, that God often leads them to do all sorts of other things that go against God's will. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is that God opposes pride and arrogance. Alright. So, as a believer, as a Christian, as a person that desires to have God in control of your, your life, he realizes you cannot afford to allow pride to go unaddressed, unhandled. So, he allows a lot of situations that I'm sure we can begin to recognize in our own lives to take place so that we begin to uh, deal with our pride issues. Now it becomes an individual choice. You can decide to deal with it and recognize it, or you can ignore it and keep having the same problems over and over and over again. But God will not move the way that he's able to until you let go of self enough to put him back in his rightful place. Mm -hmm. As long as somebody else is sitting on the throne, he can't be your God. <clears throat> and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. It can be a job. It can be money. It can be a hobby. It can be a lot of different things that can be sitting on the throne of your life, meaning that it takes priority over everything in your life, and that's your God. Mm -hmm. You can say, I love the Lord all day long. Mm -hmm. Wave your hand, reach by, do everything you want to. But how you live your life and who you seek first and how you proceed in your everyday actions will reveal who's on the altar of your life. Okay? Questions, comments? Alright, number two. There is a clear difference between worldly wisdom and true wisdom. That's a deep right there. The difference, big difference between worldly wisdom and true wisdom. Keep reading that block art, please, now. The Bible also teaches that there are different types of wisdom. Mm -hmm. There is worldly wisdom, <coughs> and there is true or godly wisdom. All right. Next there, step. Go ahead. There are numerous scriptures <coughs> on the difference between two types of wisdom and how God sees worldly wisdom. It is foolishness in God's eyes. All right, let's turn to that, that text. First Corinthians, we're already there. Let's look at the third chapter this time, verses 18 and 19. First Corinthians, third chapter, verses 18 and 19. All right, now while we're turning there, what, give me some examples of worldly wisdom. What are some examples of worldly wisdom? School. School? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> Education? All right. Is there anything wrong with education? No. no. Oh, that's good. It can be a tool and an asset to help you. Yeah. But when you make it for God, there you go. When everything you do, you rationalize intellectually. I gotta go to school first. I can't go out here and do stuff. Yeah. All right. It's an excuse. We can dig in that a little bit. Yeah, we could. Okay. So what? Give me another example. Worldly wisdom. Holding a certain high level position at your job. Very good. Good. Anybody else? Politics. Mm -hmm. Politics. Politics is the one I was waiting for. <laughs> 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 like you can be all gone and cheer at a football game, but you can't be all gone when you come to church. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> you don't need to say, well, I don't want to be out of place. You're out of place at the football game. Yeah, that's something. We do that, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> On this, this is a tab. <laughs> Why is it that we can just 
act, act crazy at, at, at social gatherings. Like who went to the Patty Bell concert? Ooh. You, don't, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Favorite musical artist uh, concert. Uh, it's very rare you just don't sit there and cheer. That's right. Even the gospel concert, yeah, that, that's true. So, how is it we feel comfortable enough to express ourselves there? But is God any less good in the sanctuary or the sanctuary? They don't mean you gotta run around that crazy. Because everybody running around that crazy ain't gonna be real easy. But the point of it is, if you truly are engaged in worship, and you have experienced God in a way that really ministers to you, right. first of all, there should be some type of understanding of what you are encountering. Mm -hmm. And then the expression of how it comes out is different for everybody. Right. And then, but should you feel the need to express it a certain way, you shouldn't feel the need to feel bad about it. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell the stars at church. I think sometimes we feel like, and I'm guilty of it, when you know you got one person, you got a Bible study on you, Feel like it's an extra thing you gotta do. We, we use, we take it that it's like our job or us going to school or, but it's not. Because when you, it's different when you come into a church. You supposed to leave yourself at the door, really in the car. Because when you on church ground, this is supposed to be holy ground. So when you walk into the doors, we're supposed to be ready to worship instead of looking at each other like, yeah, like my yeah. like, and the adults feel like that, like their parents made them come. Mm -hmm. So that's why I tell the youth choir, especially on Sunday morning when it's like the crowd is just dead, mm -hmm. and you cheer the kids' games. That's true. I said, don't look at them. Mm -hmm. Sing like God has blessed you. Amen. And that's not at all supposed to be, but I mean, I'm guilty. I don't feel like I'm going to rehearsal. Mm -hmm. People at work just to me, you got to go to church tonight, tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I do. You know, and I'm proud to say that I can because a lot of people that wants to come to church, they need to look into a deep, different way. The word God is blessed that you're able to come to church, that you can hear and see His His word, His His works, everything. Because I've been saying, you know, it's times that I didn't want, I couldn't come. I couldn't pray for myself. Right, right. We all been in that And it's almost like we can be a diehard fan at these games. But God would like for us to be a diehard fan for Him in the church as well. Yeah. This is the way it works now. Everybody know I come to church on uh, Wednesday night. Yeah. And then Friday, you Okay, pray for me tonight. You know, you know, I said, Yeah, they pay attention. That's so true. Yeah. And it's just. We have to approach it every time. I mean, not just Sunday mornings, it's rehearsal the whole time. Anytime we're engaged in worship, what we're doing right now is a form of worship. All right, we're always be engaged in worship when we're encountering God. Now, the flip side to that, let me help you all with something. Yes, we should approach it that way. God can move in unknown ways when everybody puts their mind on worshiping and praising Him Amen. because He truly does inhabit the praise of His people. But should nobody else respond or say a single thing? It does not have to disrupt your prayer. Right. Nor should you wait until yes. you see somebody else engage in worship to feel comfortable enough to let yourself engage in worship. Because a lot of times, if you do that, the enemy is using those people and then what you may think is going on with them to keep you from being the person that leads us all into worship. So don't let him use that as a tool to discourage you. Yeah, everybody should. They should analyze themselves individually to make sure that they're not becoming a hindrance to anything. But don't let nobody stop, stop your praise. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. I agree with that, too. Sometimes. Look, sometimes. You could be the prayer vessel. That's right. 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 Especially sometimes the ushers, they send them there just fine. <laughs> Next thing you know, they shout. Yeah. 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 That is so true. Did I see another hand on here? No, I was looking at um, TVN the other day with um, Mr. Kara Shoot. And he said a good thing. He was talking, they were talking about priorities and how you value your time with God and give your time with God. And he was talking about how people. Sometimes you get so bogged down with other things and other people, you forget God. And he says, start looking at prioritize things. Get you a bag, more or less, a list. 
and prioritize yes. what you're going to do for God and what you're going to allow other people to cause you not to do for God. And I thought that was a good thing because you do, you get bogged down sometimes, and I'm speaking for myself. My thing is run, run, run for other people. And I never run for me, you know, I'm on the back burner. And so you get so overwhelmed yeah. with what you need to do for yourself or what you're neglecting yourself of. Trying to do for other people. But then sometimes you have to think, am I working, actually working for God or am I working against God yeah. in some of the things that we're doing? It's so easy to do. And that's important. I'm glad she said that because the other part of that, it is so important. That's why I thank you all. I know y'all pray for me. And I appreciate that. But pray for your leaders. Pray for your worship leaders, your musicians, your president, our presidents, your elders, all the leaders because it, you get attacked when you're trying to lead God's people into these, these moments of worship and whatnot. And we have to, to have people that help us, like Elder Wallace is describing, to withstand things so that we don't get so consumed with all the other. I'm going to be transparent to you all right now. I had a horrible day today. Horrible. You got ridden up too? <laughs> 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 I had, you know, I'm surprised it had nothing to do with politics. It, I didn't even have time to deal with any type of politics. And I called her, I texted her, called her, I don't know which one I did. I called her when I was leaving work. What did I call her text? And I asked her, <laughs> I said, I need you to pray for me because I'm just having a horrible day. And there's so much going on. And since I made that call of text, it's lifted some. So I'm assuming she prayed. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to mention a while ago. Sometimes you can't pray for yourself. I was so frustrated. I just wanted to do something. Yeah. And I had all, I had to get ready for tonight. I had to do all these different things. And I, I can't afford to step into a space where I'm trying to lead God's people in that space. So I needed help to get that off of me so that I could be here and do what I know God needs me to do. So we all need help sometimes. Yeah. And, and that's why you hear me say all the time, somebody pray for me somewhere. I know because I know I couldn't pray for myself at different times. So there's nothing wrong with this. A situation happened, similar like what you said, a real rough day. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered I had to run to the dry cleaner or it flow. Uh, and I ran in, grabbed the cleaners, and as I was coming out, there was a gentleman standing arms folded just like yours and he said God see this and he said I'm praying for you and I said thank you and he said that's all I want to tell you and I got my car left but, <laughs> but that meant so much and then I started thinking as I was driving back to work of what he said and I felt like God put him there to encourage me. Mm -hmm. And it did help because by the time I got there, I wasn't as all upset as what I once was. But I was really thankful that God put him there yeah. to help me at that time. Thank you for that. God will do that for you, y'all. He, he knows what we need. A lot of times we get so caught up in our emotions. He'll send something, somebody, you'll read something, you'll hear something, and you know it's God speaking to you. And it resonates in you in a way like nothing else. And when that happens, feast on that, pay attention to it, and it'll make you want to give God thanks and praise because you realize he really is good. Yeah. All right. Uh, anybody has any questions or comments? Uh, we were talking about worldly wisdom. Yes. And I was thinking, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there are people that I know in my circle that know everything about what's going on outside of the church, outside of the Bible. They know all the gossip. They all know what's going on with Pat LaBelle, when Pat LaBelle is going to be here, how much Pat LaBelle is going to call, all that. But when it comes to this book, uh, mm -hmm. have you heard this song by Shirley Caesar? It's they don't, they can't, they can't relate. Mm -hmm. So would you call that worldly wisdom? Uh, I, I say street. They got a lot of street sense. Yes. But when it comes to what's going on on the inside of the sanctuary, the sermon, mm -hmm. 
nothing can't commit. Absolutely. So I, I was, exactly. is that worldly? Yes. To summarize it, what she's saying, mm -hmm. I asked you for examples, we gave examples. Worldly wisdom is when whatever you're dealing with is dictated and guided by things of this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When that is the focal point, and that's what you described, when that's the focal point. It can even be a gospel artist. But if it has a worldly attachment to it, mm -hmm. and you have a pride thing with it, or they have a pride thing, and it's not uplifting God as the focus, mm -hmm. then it's worldly. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is helping us distinguish the difference between wisdom that's guided by him, which is spiritual. How can you recognize spiritual wisdom? What's the main ingredient that will always let you know that it's spiritual? It's I kind of gave you a clue a second ago. It's in line with the word. It's in line with the word. That's a good one. That it will be. It will be. You feel it? Yes. The, the spirit. The spirit. Spirit. The spirit is God. It is done by the spirit. We're going to help you. It uplifts yeah. God and his kingdom. If what you're doing, even like take a, a, a preacher on Sunday morning. He, can, he or she can preach really, really great. Mm -hmm. It'd be an emotional service. Mm -hmm. But if at the end of that message, if it did not uplift God as the focal point, it didn't mean anything. <laughs> so it trickles down from that. Anything we do in life, if it does not ultimately at the end of it uplift God as the focal point and, and enlighten us to draw uh, closer to him or be more aware of him, then it doesn't really amount to anything. Okay? And all of that is done by the Spirit. Okay? Questions, comments? I have something to say. I don't want to share it, but um, this morning, you know, I really didn't watch the election, and actually I didn't even worry about it, but this morning I woke up like 3 o'clock with Job on my mind. Mm -hmm. And I was at first, wasn't like, okay, what is it about, you know? And then I thought about how um, God allowed him to go through so much, and his mind was still set on God. And so the entire day, <coughs> that's what my mind was. Wow. It was Job. I was like, oh my God, you did a, um, when my work was called and she was flustered and I told her too and she said, oh my goodness, thank you. And I, he was on my mind all day and I was like, Lord, you keep looking at the three o'clock. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that was on my mind all day. So, it, I mean, it, it didn't worry about me. I didn't have no issues running against nothing or anything. I felt free. <laughs> And that's and thank you for sharing that. That's that's what God wants to do with us. And what she described is what He means when He says, "Meditate on My Word." And I, when God deposits something in you, when He speaks something to you, when you read something, you hear something, and you know it's speaking to you, think on it, meditate on it, let it minister to you. Because what tends to happen is kind of what she described. Over the course of your day, you will encounter things that will try to take your mind off of. And that's the world trying, the enemy trying to snatch the seed of it because it's beginning to produce something in you that's helping you, that's giving you peace, that's giving you strength. So if he can get you to disrupt your thinking off of it and go back to thinking about problems, bills, people, all of that, then he took what was something that was really ministering to you and deafened it to where you don't even hear it anymore. And now all you can hear is what's right in front of you. So that's why he tells us to meditate on it day and night, and then you will prosper whatever you do. Good, good point. Anybody else? Alright, let's read this text. Talk about uh, worldly wisdom and true wisdom. 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, verses 18 and 19. Don't fool yourself. If any of you think you are wise in the things of this world, you will have to become foolish because you can, because before you can be truly wise. Mm -hmm. This is because God considers the wisdom of this world to be foolish. It is just as the scriptures say, God catch the wise when they try to outsmart them. Okay. <laughs> you got another translation they want to read? All right, let's deal with that. It, I like this. It says you must become foolish so that you can become wise. Well, I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is spiritual wisdom. <laughs> Transform it 
woman can give you his true wisdom. <laughs> now, the only danger is if you become, if you were foolish in the world, and then you become wise, well, then you're just a wise fool. <laughs> If we're honest, like you just said, you can't really be wise until you have been a fool. You've been foolish in some regard of your life. And what does it mean to be a fool as it pertains to God? What does it mean? Anybody know what the Bible says about what a fool is? It says there's no God. Exactly. When you are not fully aware of God's sovereignty, you are a fool. Right. God's not sovereign. Now, it comes in different ways. You know, There's a lot of people who are, like I said, they're, they're Spirit, they're religious fools, I should say. Because they haven't really come fully aware of who God is. So, in God's outside, they haven't really mm -hmm. transitioned into his true wisdom. But when you begin to tear down your foolish ways and self-pride, we've talked about pride, and begin to realize it's not all about me, it's not about what I can do, there's a God that's greater than me that I need to start paying attention to, that's when you begin to let go of the foolish things and become wise. Because now you grab the most true wisdom. There, that's that's the best one of the best examples of Saul's transition from Saul to Paul. He thought he was doing right. Yeah. He thought he was. He was speaking in church. Mm -hmm. But it's, and when he had that encounter, oh, he, didn't he didn't know. He didn't know. And but what I love about how God used Paul, a lot of times when you are a really good sinner, you can be a really good Christian. Because the same passion that you have for doing wrong, if you do get it right, put him out. But the, but the same, but the same passion you have for doing wrong, right. when you do get it right, yeah. you can be really passionate and helpful for God. Yeah. And LK was joking, but he is that man. And he's helped a lot of people because the same energy and the same methods he used when he was in the world, God is now used for his glory. So, you know, just because your or your past doesn't mean that God can't use what you're good at to get glory out of it. Okay? All right. Questions, comments? All right. So we read that text. Let's read the rest of that and try to get into number three before we run out of time. The combination of pride and worldly wisdom is a recipe for disaster. You've got to recognize the difference between the two. All right, number three. Let's read on number three real quick. Trying to find God or understand spiritual matters solely through one's intellect does not work. All right, that kind of goes back to what I think Elder Jones said. Education can become a form of a, a worldly wisdom. Meaning that when you, and it's not just school. It is that, but it, street smarts. You can be real street smart. And it really did help you spiritually. Amen. So we have to recognize that spiritual matters only work when God is the author of what you're focusing on. All right, let's read through here. There are different ways of knowing things. Our mind or intellect is one way. But when it comes to understanding spiritual truth, it is God who opens our eyes. All right, and reveals these things. How many of you all had a moment that you can recall where God opened your mind to something? Anybody? I'm hoping that you all have, and if you haven't, you know the difference because it's like you 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 probably been reading something your whole life or hearing something your whole life, scripture your whole life. But something happens to where you hear it or see it, yeah, and it, so, yeah. it just becomes something whole new to you. Yeah. That's when God opens your eyes to something that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. All right. One thing that I grew up with, uh, and God opened my eyes to, is that uh, when old folks used to say that, you, if when you become a Christian, you can lose your salvation. And they said if you sin, you're going to hell. But if that's true, then why did Christ die? 
So how did your eyes get opened on? Because I started studying. All right, and what, did, what, did, what happened? It revealed to me that, yeah, I'm saved. And that don't give me uh, license to go out and sing. But if I'm truly saved, I won't lose my salvation. All right. Saved. Now, let's describe truly saved. And I've asked y'all this before, so this should be formed. Is everybody who's baptized truly saved? No. no. All right. What determines being truly saved? When you give your life totally over to Christ. When you give your life totally over to Christ. Yes, but it starts with something else first. You know that acceptance? All right, let's talk about this acceptance thing. What are the requirements to accepting salvation? Confession. Confession. All right. All right, there we go. All right, we get to it now. What is it based on? Faith. Faith. Faith in what? Faith in what? Yeah. His finished work, the whole process of what he did. Yeah, yeah, I have, you have to lay this because people pick parts of it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? The gospel of Jesus Christ tells us his birth, yeah. his life, yeah. his death, yeah. his resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, when you hear about that and you believe it, receive it, accept it, put your faith on it, then the blood seals you. Yeah, it covers you, it seals you to the day of redemption. That's what it tells us. Okay. Now, the problem is a lot of people have professed in different variations of that without hearing the totality of Jesus' finished work. So it leaves people confused on the salvation thing. But once you have truly heard and accepted faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God, God saves you. He protects you. Now, the, th the thought behind that, well, I can do what I want to do. No, when you were really accepted and did change, he changes your thoughts, yeah. changes your mentality. You don't think like you used to think, so you no longer have a desire to just go out and do the things you used to do. So you begin to walk towards this perfected Christ, and while you're walking, this is the part that you ought to really shout about, grace and mercy covers you through your mistakes. So that you no longer have to feel guilty about when I make a mistake. Right. It's not that I purposely set out to do wrong, but in my shortcomings, the blood still covers me and protects me. Mm -hmm. But this is only for true believers that have been connected with God through faith and His finished work. Does that make sense? Please, if it don't, let's talk. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's what repentance, That's what repentance right, is. Right. Repentance is when those things come up or when you right. fall in those places, oh, when you turn away from it and become godly sorry, then that's when those things apply to that they cover it, wash it away, there is therefore now no condemnation, all those things. But as long as you stand in a place of, of a continual cycle, you keep it yourself. Okay. Away from your own brother, I should say. You're keeping yourself from being saved. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit is for. The Holy right. Spirit is there to convict you to right. do things. That's right. And, and when you see... Convict. Let, uh, let's deal with this convict. I don't want to convict and condemn. Did I explain the difference between the two? All right. Let, let, me, let me explain it. Because I don't want, when you hear convict, I don't want you to feel condemned. I know you don't understand, but I want to make sure people understand it. What's, what's the difference between convict and condemn? Condition is when you personally feel that you have did something wrong. When God makes you aware of your mistakes. Yes. Condemnation is when you are replayed, it's replayed over and over again. Mm -hmm. Now God will make you aware of your mistakes so that you can repent. Right. Once you repent, he's done with it. Mm -hmm. Now you can keep we yourself there. And that's the difference. But see, a lot of people keep themselves there and say, God ain't for daddy, man. God, you know what I'm saying? That's the trick. That's the fault. You got to know that so that when that happens, you can stand on the word that says, there's therefore now no condemnation, all these things. It's okay for God to make you aware of it. When my, my kids do something wrong, I'm going to make them aware of it. <laughs> but I'm not, once they get it right and they fix it, I'm not going to hold it over their head. You know what I'm saying? So he operates with us the same way. But we got to know that so that we don't keep ourselves condemned to things we've been already free from. Conviction lets you move on. Yes. And condemnation holds you back. There you go. I got that. I got that.
and progressive you know our king our system if you know what i Okay, we need to remember uh, in our prayer tonight, Coach is not very in this family, Charles Moore and Barbara Brooks. I did hear from Coach today. Kamina is doing better. She's not out of the woods yet, but they still got to go through some things, but she is doing better. But let's definitely keep them in there, my prayers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? Uh, my sister will be having a hip replacement in the morning. So I'm asking for the church to pray for her as well. Absolutely. You want to share that real quick? <laughs> well, I'll tell the forward. Yes, sir. I know we just had session, but I would like to see the elders for about five minutes after after this. All right. That was, that was one of the items that we didn't that we didn't take. All right. <laughs> from her doctor Monday, as you can see, she can come back out a little bit now without her mask. No, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's still, she's not 100%, so she she's still good. probably can't be covered. We don't touch it. We don't touch it. But seriously, and I'll have to make this announcement in church as well. I know you all love her, but yeah. you really love us. Here are some of this. Let's let's let us move at the pace that they require, require us to. Right. So she didn't have any setbacks. Amen. So y'all know how much she loves to hug people. So I'm trying to help her. Just <laughs> <laughs> slip up the business back before she realizes. Thank you. Yeah. And then she can <laughs> give it everything. So thank you all so much for all your prayers <laughs> and your support. It's been everything. I do, I do, I do truly love and appreciate all of you guys for your prayers. And I, I, I cannot wait to give her arms around you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you try to make a hug, you'll be rich. All right. We can start standing here. Yeah. Turn away from what the yes. world is saying and yes. fine tune our hearing 
so that we can be in tune with you yes. and the light of hope that's needed yes. for this dark period, God. Yes. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for this church family as we put our mind on you. Allow us to experience more and more of you in a way yes. we never have before. Yes. And we'll be so careful to give you the praise. We ask all these blessings in your hand of grace upon us as we leave this place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.